close to Charles Dickens' house, if you know that. Uh, okay, so sorry for making you late, but uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. no problem. <coughs> it's actually, uh, I'm actually very happy that I'm one of the last speakers because I can try to integrate a couple of things I learned from all of you the, couple of, uh, the last couple of days in my own talk. So that might explain why some of it may sound a bit improvised. It's because it is. I mean, it would have been a different talk had I been uh, one of the first speakers. Um, but I guess that's the nice thing about it. Um, one of the, some of the overlaps, I think, that I have with um, a lot of the earlier presentations, first of all, is this whole um, dilemma between inherited vocabulary and borrowed um, forms, right? And how it shapes uh, a lot of our debates that we've been having. Um, and the other one is what to do with the philological attestations you may have in a sort of older version of a language and how, do they, how can they relate to uh, reconstruction. That's another one. Um, but so, uh, I, I would say the main point that I want to talk today about is uh, loan words, what to do with them. And that's also because of my own discipline. I don't really work in a linguistic department or institution. I've always been the language guy in interdisciplinary teams, right? And then so loan words are important because people more or less have an idea of what's going on and people looking at cultural context from a non-linguistic perspective can do something with them, right? So that's um, basically my PhD in a nutshell as well, which I did at the School of Archaeology in Oxford. And that was an interdisciplinary Indian Ocean project. So my task was to look at language context in pre-modern times between Southeast Asia and everybody else, um, which in most cases, it's just uh, loan words, right? You can't really tell much about grammatical influence if there's not too many, uh, too much data. So that's where I come from. Uh, I work at an institute, which I kind of see as the little sister of SOAS. It's the Royal Netherlands Institute of Southeast Asian Caribbean <coughs> Studies. And it shares with SOAS its rather strange labyrinth-like um, architecture. Uh, colonial past and also um, potentially interesting ways of looking at non-Western uh, countries. And my own background in that is, uh, say, Malay and Javanese, which are two Austronesian languages, as you probably all know. And um, so I've, I study those. Uh, the reason I got interested in historical linguistics was because of that PhD in which I had to know, um, yeah, basically learn about the phonological histories of the languages involved. And of course, when you talk about loanwords, you're dealing with two, possibly three, phonological histories of languages that, in many cases, aren't really well described. I mean, there isn't one book of, say, the Malay phonological history, right? So you're dealing with a lot of indirect uh, evidence as well, which makes it um, very nice to do. Um, and it's, all, uh, it's, it's basically one of the... Um, ways to uh, gauge the time depth of lexical transmissions. Um, of course, the best way to see how old uh, a word is in a certain language is philology, um, specifically if you have a dated inscription, which in Southeast Asia is often the case, you would have the shaka, the sort of Indic um, um, way of uh, counting, and then you could tell exactly how old something is. If that year isn't in your inscription, you basically have to trust the philologist, uh, and they can do paleographic dating and basically say how, how old something approximately is. Uh, so you have to trust um, um, philologists for that. Um, and so um, basically along the way I learned about all of these low words, and one of the things that struck me was that a lot of them were reconstructed to quite high order levels of Austronesian, um, say, um, uh, subgrouping. So, of course, if you have attestations or reconstructions across different phylogenetic um, family trees, and they're not things like onomatopoeia or kinship terms, that is something interesting. I mean, the chances of that aren't really uh, high. And yet, uh, when I, um, or to put it a bit crass, 
came up with sort of debunked protoforms, then people at first were a bit indifferent because um, in a lot of cases the sound laws, the sound correspondences did what they expected, uh, uh, did what they were expected to look like. So you could argue that in terms of sound laws they were doing nothing unexpected, hence the reconstruction would be legitimate. Um, but then of course the reconstruction would also not really tell that much in terms of the um, sort of proto-language and you know um, all of the things you can do with a proto-language, all of these things like talking about a proto-society, right, that archaeologists really like and they take linguistic evidence for that. So that was a bit of the intersection of disciplines that I um, was um, balancing myself on and I think it works like This? Okay, yeah. Um, so basically today I'd like to raise a couple of methodological points, um, looking again at the Austronesian language family. And um, well, basically it isn't my intention to show how um, you know, other people are wrong or anything. I think in a lot of cases, Austronesian linguists have been the only people right about a certain topic when everybody else was wrong textbook example of that would be the colonization of Madagascar, which for three centuries, I mean, linguists have been known was a Austronesian uh, language. And over the past 10 years, maybe, archaeologists and geneticists have come to similar conclusions. So that would be a nice example. Um, but I do think there are a couple of um, basically uh, issues I want to uh, point out. First of all, um, looking at old texts. I think that's very important. I think for some language families like Indo-European it's very well established <coughs> that you would do that. You would have your Latin, your Sanskrit, your ancient Greek as a sort of control mechanism almost for the reconstructions that you make. Um, in the Old Sunnesian language family I would say it's only Old Javanese which you know, Old Javanese basically means 8th century, so it's not really old when you compare it to some of the Indo-European languages, of course, and their um, literary attestations. But that would be the only thing, and apart from that, most of the languages that are being used for subgrouping are modern uh, languages. So that is methodologically um, an important point to take into account um, when we talk about all Sunnesian languages. Um, the other thing um, I would say is two important borderland regions. One is New Guinea, as you can see here, where the Papuan languages are spoken historically. And the other one hereabouts is where historically there was a lot of language contact with also Asiatic languages. These are two things I will come back to. But for the time being, um, um, so I'll be looking at loanwords language contact and uh, basically the way that people from non-purely linguistic backgrounds use these types of um, insights in say interdisciplinary projects um, like the one by the way that funded the conference so that's how I know Nathan in the first place okay and um, I also want to make one point throughout uh, the talk about the archipelago archipelagic nature of the Austronesian language family and how that may or may not uh, shape the way we look at it. I mean, it's the most insular, I would say, language family. And um, I will argue along the way that that basically also shapes the way that the languages work in a very sort of, um, well, poorly understood uh, form, at least by me. But first, let's have a look at the philology in sort of the broadest sense of the word. And what are some of the issues that um, I come across in my work. Um, so, first of all, as we know from um, some of the Indo-European, Afro-Asiatic languages, we have um, copper plates, religious scriptures, um, basically all of these, uh, let's say, old texts, texts in the broadest sense of the word, that give us a very good insight in the, say, um, not really what people would have spoken on the marketplace, but would have would have been a sort of literized version of the diglossic uh, spectrum of those languages. 
Um, and these exist for um, Southeast Asia as well, for the Austronesian languages. As I said, we have Old Javanese, which is pretty well done. There are some other um, languages as well on which we have epigraphic uh, data. But for some reason, or for the reason of the absence of a dictionary primarily, you don't see them back at all in Austronesian uh, reconstructions. I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, one of the other things um, that is really nice, I think, about, um, say, early dated uh, texts in these Austronesian languages is that we can learn a lot about other language families as well, in particular Indo-Aryan, because of loan words and because the um, Indo-Aryan script, um, well, the Indic scripts, to put it that way, often don't really give as much phonological information as uh, you would have liked. For example, you wouldn't be able to tell how the short vowels, the hraspa, would have been pronounced at a specific uh, region in a specific time. Um, other things you wouldn't know if there was uh, intervocalic voicing in certain, uh, say, prakrits. And you get all of these information, this information by looking at, for example, Old Javanese, which has borrowed a lot of vocabulary from these languages. Um, and I suppose you could make a similar argument if you go west and look at um, Prakrit borrowings in, in Persian, for example, Middle Persian. You could get similar, uh, say, additional puzzle pieces about uh, the historical phonology. Although, you know, a bit strangely to me, nobody has really done that, so that would be a thing. Or maybe something else, uh, maybe a gap in the literature that at least I have um, come across. Um, and then, of course, there is the earliest European descriptions, which in a lot of cases, a couple of centuries, 300 years, of a number of Austronesian languages, which for most of them will be the earliest um, extant descriptions in the first place. And there's nice things that could be done with those as well. One of my favorite examples is um, my colleague Alexander Adela, who has used, um, say, missionary, um, well, uh, archives to make a complete reconstruction of the extinct Siraya language, Formosan and Austronesian language um, that's spoken in the north of Taiwan. Um, basically using almost corpus linguistics um, and um, making a grammar of this language. So that's uh, interesting as well and I always wondered why couldn't something like that be done for Malay as well with you know, so many old word lists that um, basically tell you a very um, early stage of language development um, as well, which would be interesting for um, Austronesian linguistics, I would say. And my favorite example is the Cham language, which is the oldest epigraphically, um, say, available Austronesian language spoken in Vietnam and Cambodia, what is now Vietnam? Vietnam and Cambodia, still spoken. It behaves in a very Mon Khmer-like way, but it's um, evidently phylogenetically um, Austronesian, quite closely related to Malay as well. And that has been reconstructed as well. Um, there is one book uh, which is the reconstruction of proto Cham. The problem is that old epigraphic Cham isn't taken into account, so what you rather get is not necessarily proto Cham but a type of early medieval, uh, you could say, vulgar cham, which in its phonological development is much more recent, seems to be much more recent than what you get in uh, old texts. So that's important as well. Something that is called proto might actually be relatively recent. Um, and then again, the sort of philological evidence becomes a um, cross-check mechanism. Um, and my point is that, I mean, this could happen more in <coughs> Austronesian historical linguistics. See if there's anything. Um, oh, the other thing that is really fun is um, Old Sundanese. It's one of the languages of Java. There are manuscripts being found, quite old ones, uh, even now in these uh, sort of modern times when families don't really know what to do with it you know, boxes they have on their at in their attic, and basically they turn out to be of enormous linguistic value as well. It's just that nobody can read them anymore. So that's also, you know, something that um, 
could be quite high on the agenda of Osunishian historical linguistics, but as far as I know, isn't really at this point. So, you know, that is sort of avenue of potential collaboration. Now, to move on to the second point, which is language contact. Um, and these are all for my uh, earlier work, by the way. But um, basically, um, first to contextualize them a bit, uh, language contact is quite complicated when we talk about all Sunnisian languages because first of all we have these two um, areas of language mixing one of them with the uh, what we call Papuan languages but they're actually quite distinct families as well we just don't know the exact history yet that is an area called Wallacea named after Alfred Russell Wallace the zoologist who worked in um, Eastern Indonesia and discovered how the zoology was quite unique in that region. Well, the languages are as well, because they're all, I mean, if you believe in the concept mixed languages, so they take over each other's features. It doesn't really make sense anymore in that area to talk about all Sunnitian versus Papuan languages, because um, people should go to each other's conferences, and they often do. Um, the other one, which is, um, I think, a bit less thoroughly understood is um, the sort of Mon Khmer or Sunnitian, um, say, mixed area. So Cham we talked about as well. But there's also languages in Sumatra, in Kalimantan, that have distinct sort of also Asiatic features and even low words. Um, one of my students, my first PhD student, has just finished a book on Karinchi, which is a Malayic language, but um, it has this fascinating phenomenon of phrasal alternation in which every word has a different ending, whether or not it's um, sort of contextualized phrasally or um, standing as an independent form. Um, and the sound laws used for that aren't all Sunnitian at all. It, it much more resembles something like Khmer or the uh, Mon Khmer language is spoken now presently on the mainland. So. These are the language contexts of a sort of more uh, of a deeper time depth. But I've been looking at the Indian or Indic uh, language context as well, making a list of words that I thought weren't really sort of real protoforms um, to begin with, or may, there may have been real protoforms if you just go by the sound laws, you expect the sound laws, but they were borrowed, is my point. Um, from different places, from the Indo Aryan languages, but also from Dravidian languages, in which um, Tamil seems to have been quite important. And also, I mean, Hindi isn't really the right word because Hindi itself wasn't really used as a term um, at the time of contact, but a sort of uh, medieval Prakrit, I would say. So those are some of the um, basically um, things that I came across. And what was interesting is that a lot of them were reconstructed to Proto-Western Malaya Polynesian, um, which, depending on who you believe, is a bit of a tricky uh, subfamily to begin with. Um, it happens to be the case that Proto-Malaya Polynesian involves all of the languages historically in contact with the broader Indian Ocean world to begin with. Not the Pacific, not Taiwan, but basically what is now Indonesia and the Philippines, precisely the area where you would have expect loan words from Indian, um, Indian Ocean languages in. So that's um, interesting as well, because the next question then would become how legitimate is um, the subfamily, if it's full of uh, things that can be demonstrated to be loan words. Um, I don't have the answer to that one as well, but it is something um, to take into account, especially if, for example, they do unexpected things like the Malay R corresponding to an L in Philippine languages, which would have been a G, a G, if it were inherited, these kind of things. So there's a couple of red flags um, there as well. And thus far, I haven't been publicly executed in the Osunnesian circles. This was published in Oceanic Linguistics. So I think um, that's fine. Also, because you can revert the logic and say, I'm going to use, you know, Austronesian linguistics to debunk some of the fake uh, loanword scenarios that are being promulgated in the wider literature 
uh, not necessarily by linguists, but by well, social media experts, newspapers. Uh, it seems to be that a lot of people want uh, things that are also niche and to be from other parts of the world. And then uh, historical linguistics and linguistic reconstruction can actually be a corrective mechanism there as well, to say, for example, these words aren't really from Sanskrit, from Tamil, or from Arabic, but they can be reconstructed quite regularly. Um, and you know, there's a, there's a bit of a problem with the uh, non-linguists who are obviously interested in language. I get a lot of questions um, through email as well about where does a word really come from. So there is some sort of societal interest in that as well. Um, but there are a lot of people who really want a lot of Western or Tunisian words to come from India, which reminded me of the uh, popular 1990s character from the BBC show, Goodness Gracious Me. Um, you should watch it, it's really funny. But even in a European context, there will be this uh, you know, stereotypical Greek uncle at a way so everything comes from Greek, so it's not really unique or anything. Okay. Um, then, which is, I suppose, the last point of um, some of the things, some of the issues that I come across, and this has been mentioned yesterday as well during the keynote, is the problem of doublets in uh, Austronesian languages in general, but specifically in Western Malay or Polynesian. Um, these are just a couple that I found in a paper by Robert Blust, but there are hundreds and hundreds more. I think the Austronesian language family may be one of the most, I mean, has the highest fecundity of the reconstruction of potential doublets. You can see there's different types as well. Some actually share a um, morphological unit or a morphemic unit. Others um, are basically throughout all of the languages that have been reconstructed, you find these two forms coexisting. Now, what does that mean? Um, does it say something about the language family? Does it say something about the people doing reconstructions? Probably a bit of both. Remember, uh, we're talking about a lot of islands that weren't really isolated. Um, this was an archipelago, um, archipelago, archipelago sorry, where people were coming back and forth, where people were maritime in their orientation. So there is a bit of a sort of continuous tradition of going back and forth. If you remember your paradigmatic Austronesian family tree, it branches off in like eight different things and then one of these sub-branches goes again in eight and then one in eight as well, which would basically suggest that it was a multi or monodirectional uh, movement. Um, but of course people were going all over the place and secondary borrowing and these kinds of things seems to be quite um, the norm. Um, one of the things where I think protoforms could really give a wrong impression is um, one of the case studies. Uh, I got an email by an anthropologist looking into words for taboo in Austronesian, basically, languages. And what you find um, going through the Austronesian comparative dictionary is that it reconstructs really, really high up. Um, but the only legitimate reconstruction here is the oceanic one which makes it a Pacific sort of thing. Whereas the other attestations, and these are basically varieties of the same natural language, um, are only attested in one tiny corner of Indonesia, and they also mean something different. So um, that is a bit of a problem for the sort of non-linguists who want to use Austronesian reconstructed data for their own work. Um, because um, some reconstructions maybe shouldn't be there or shouldn't be made. Um, but of course, who decides these things, right? I mean, there's no high Supreme Court of historical linguistics or anything like that. So um, it's also one of the things um, I come across. Um, I think I'm slowly moving to a number of concluding remarks. Which is, first of all, um, the earlier point that it might be a bit of a problem for Austronesian linguistics, specifically, not necessarily the Pacific or Taiwan, but specifically, um, say, the Indonesian archipelago, 
which people say is a cradle of globalization and people are moving back and forth for the past three millennia, um, that there, is, there seems to be little collaboration yet between, say, um, the historical linguists working on the region and the philologists. Um, that is one of the points um, that I think could be, um, you know, could get some attention in the future. Um, and so, yeah, it, it kind of makes me a bit jealous if I look at some of the Indo-European stuff in which there seems to be, I mean, it might be that the grass is always greener, but there seems to be more um, attention for people looking at um, philologically attested old languages versus what you can do in terms of reconstruction. Maybe the same with Semitic, uh, the Semitic branch of um, 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 and the other thing is, I think the really cool computational stuff that happens, for example, for um, Sino-Tibetan is not really the norm either yet in Austronesian linguistics, although there are people doing it now, so that's nice. Um, then again, the good thing about the Austronesian languages is that there is, of course, a lot of data um, and that a lot of people are working on it. Some regions are pretty well done. Um, others, such as Eastern Indonesia, I mean, very, very little uh, actually makes it even to the Austronesian Comparative Dictionary. So that is a bit of a um, problem now in terms of knowing uh, where the field is moving and, and what reconstructions are there. And, and basically, um, that is a bit data deprived now at this moment, I would say. Um, so finally, and this is where my earlier research sort of comes in, is how these things then resonate with um, other people who have an interest in um, old languages, to put it that way, but aren't historical linguists. So the archaeologists that I work with, um, the historians. I mean, archaeology is nice because these people are interested in um, all sorts of data, zoology, um, genetics, um, language, plant science, all of it. Um, historians, I would say, less so, even though they could learn a lot from, well, people like all of you, for example, um, in terms of what a region looked like prior to the uh, appearance of um, the earliest documents and descriptions. Um, that's not really happening, I, I suppose, too much in, in um, Southeast Asia. Some do it, but it's, it's exceptional. So I, I think this might end up being a bit of a plea for um, closer collaboration as well between all of these disparate fields. Um, you know, maybe over cocktails and pizza, I'm not sure. But um, one of the things I was interested in as well, and maybe that could be talked about during uh, Q&A, is also how some of this resonates to um, you know, the, the fields that you're working on and how it's completely different or similar. What are some of the problems? maybe also what are some of the solutions um, about all of this. So, yeah, I guess that's it. Um, thanks for, not sure if I made it in the right time slot or? Yes, you are. Oh. Okay. Thank you.